Albin Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is home ownership consultant Ross Kay from the wealthyhomeowner.ca. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Hey, and thanks for having me back, Jim. Ross, the IMF says Canada should not lessen the impact of its stress test for new home buyers, that it should keep it. Should Canada keep the stress test? Should they keep the stress test? Well, what I, what I would love to hear, Jim, what I would love to hear is the OSFI uh, come clean on what the stress test really is. And I wish that uh, Mr. Rudin, who runs the OSFI, would come publicly, come pu- come out publicly, and ex- state exactly what the new stress test is and what it is not. Because one of the greatest myths in the Canadian housing industry today, Jim, is the new mortgage stress test. Because the new mortgage stress test is actually not a new test at all. It's an old test. It's a test that was followed for about 50 years. It's a test that was designed to protect Canadian homeowners decades ago. It's a test that almost every single home in this country that is sold over the last, been purchased over the last 40 years followed. So here we have today, what are we, about two years Another misrepresentation, Jim. I mean, let, let's be honest. Everybody is saying the new mortgage stress test started in 2018. Well, anyone can go and go do a Google search and see that the first phase of this identical test was brought in in January of 2017, a year earlier, where at that time it only applied to first-time home buyers. So all of you listeners should think about this. Why did the OSFI bring in a stress test in two different times? The identical stress test, supposedly new, first covering first-time buyers and then covering everyone else. Why? Why did they do it that way? Then you've also got to ask, how did the British Columbia um, governments screw it up? How did the British Columbia governments be the only ones in Canada to screw it up for a whole year, 2017, when they added that $37,000 first time home buyer credit via a interest free loan. How did, why did the BC government do it? Well, they did it because no one understands what the stress, the new stress test actually is. It's just reverting, Jim, to the standard stress test that existed in pre July of 2012. So let your listeners let that sink in. I am debunking the stress test right here on air for your listeners. In 2012, July, Jim Flaherty changed mortgage lending rules. He dropped the amortization from a maximum of 30 years back to 25 years, which is the long-term historical average. A 25-year mortgage in a country where the maximum Term, generally speaking, I know we can have 10-year terms, but five-year terms are the overwhelmingly, the majority of uh, home buyers uh, use, utilize those. They don't use the 10-year term. Um, with a 25-year amortization, creates a sound home ownership um, structure for, for home buyers. So Mr. Flaherty dropped it in July of 2012 from the 30 years back down to the 25 years. Remember, that's the same government who extended the amortizations to 40 years uh, in the Great Recession. Dropped it to 35, dropped it to 30, and dropped it back to 25. Seems like a pretty prudent way of handling the economy, in my opinion. Mr. Flaherty also did at that time what he made another change for the first time in Canadian history. He allowed high credit score homebuyers to utilize 39% 
of their income to cover their home ownership costs, 39%. That was the first time that that number changed. He did that solely to accommodate mortgage renewals on the 25-year amortization. He did it genuine in the great interest of the country. But guess what happened? The banks capitalized on it. What the banks did was, and what you can see in CMHC data, StatsCan data, bank data, which has been all misrepresented to the public over the last three years, is that he allowed high credit score home buyers to use 39% of their own income to qualify for a mortgage. He had no idea, Jim, that the banks were going to capitalize on that, that the banks were going to become predatory lenders, lenders who would encourage home buyers to take on more mortgage debt than what the history of Canadian home buyers shows to be prudent. The OSFI jumped in, Jim, and they said when they found out, <laughs> when they first found out this was going on, they didn't believe it, I don't believe. They certainly didn't believe us when we told them it, told them it that the banks were doing these predatory lending practices based on high credit score home buyers. Now imagine, listener, you start only lending money to high credit score home buyers, which are able to leverage their income higher. That naturally produced every single chart about debt to GDP, uh, debt to income that, that exists in print today. Yet you haven't heard it debunked as we are debunking it right now. And I didn't intend to debunk this today on the show. What the OSFI did, Jim, is they instituted a variable gross debt service ratio. So let me debunk everything everyone has heard about the new mortgage stress test once and for all. The government of Canada, the OSFI, instituted a variable gross debt service ratio that through its design moderates itself as interest rates change. What that means is, as interest rates rise, the impact on GDS is less. As interest rates fall, the impact on your maximum gross debt service ratio increases. They have done this so that at 6% interest rates, the variable gross debt service ratio maximum returns to the historical norm of 31%. What the OSFI did was, without telling anyone, was to return the gross debt service ratio maximum to its historical norm. Not only that, they made the measurement variable. So the measurement now works with interest rates. It protects the consumer on the upward rise of interest rates, and it protects them as interest rates fall. It was ingenious. I wonder who the firm was that recommended to the OSFI to institute a variable gross debt service ratio in the first place. I wonder who that firm was. Well, I know that I have the emails from the OSFI responding to our request for a variable gross debt service ratio. I know that what you have today is a variable gross debt service ratio. It is so variable that, and, and, and it factually returns to the historical norm Canadian home buyers have followed for decades, that the variableness of, of the ratio allows home buyers in Vancouver to borrow more of their income to service their mortgage debt than anywhere else in Canada. The second place, best place, where this, the leverage works, the variable nature of, of the stress test, is in Toronto, where that is the second highest place where you can borrow income, mortgage debt, against your income. What it also takes into consideration is Calgary, Regina, Montreal, Windsor, London, Ontario. All of these places now are impacted by the variable gross debt service ratio. And what that means is house price change going forward will be altered because of the variable gross debt service ratio, now called the new stress test. The question must be asked, why has the OSFI not come clean with the math that proves this is a variable gross debt service ratio? Why did they call it 
a new stress test when it was simply returning Canada to its historical roots of a 31% maximum gross debt service ratio. Why did they not tell the public that as interest rates rise, the impact of the stress test will be reduced, and as interest rates fall, the impact of the stress test will be increased, something designed to moderate house price change in, house price change in a market. Why have they not said that? Anyone can get a calculator out today and find out what I have just revealed on, on this podcast is 100% true. You can't argue math. You can get your calculator out and, and find out that is exactly what the government decided to do, the OSFI. The question is, why haven't they told anybody? Why have they pretended it is a new stress test when it is just a return to the one traditionally followed by Canadians for decades? Why are they not admitting they instituted a variable gross debt service ratio? Why have they not admitted that? The only reason I can come up with, Jim, with bank quarterly earnings coming up starting tomorrow, Tomorrow, you're going to have CIBC and I believe um, uh, RBC or TD releases tomorrow. The only reason I can believe that the OSFI has not come clean on this is because they were uh, afraid of rating and rating agencies misreading the lending practices of Canadian banks, which we call predatory on a 39% gross debt service ratio on high credit score Canadians. And they would have downgraded uh, uh, their uh, ratings, which would have caused interest rates to have to go up, which would have put undue pressure on the economy. That is the only reason, Jim, that I can understand or think why they would not come clean. But I want your listeners to know, in 2015, when we sent our request to the OSFI, we specifically requested the government institute a variable gross debt service ratio. We said that because we knew how interest rates and mortgage lending interact with one another. There was nothing wrong with borrowing 30% of your income when interest rates were at uh, or 32% of your income when interest rates were at 9%. There was nothing wrong with that. Because if interest rates went up, the impact of the payment is very small. The converse happens when interest rates are low. When interest rates fell below 4% on a five-year term, all of a sudden the risk accelerates. Because a rise in rates has a disproportionate increase in your mortgage payment versus at the high end, the, the back in the 9%, the 10% day. What you have today, folks, that has, and this does not appear, appear anywhere in print. This has not appeared in any news report in Canada today. But when you get out your calculator and you calculate what the meaning of these changes are, you will see OSFI instituted a variable gross debt service ratio that when interest rates are at 6%, returns Canada to the national historic average of gross debt service ratio followed by tens of millions of Canadian families over the last 40 years. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. 
Grand Portage Resources recently completed the 2018 drill program on its 100% controlled Herbert Gold Discovery property located in the prolific Juno Belt in southeast Alaska. Drill results are expected through late 2018. Past drill results included numerous multi-ounce gold assays on multiple veins. Grand Portage trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, I believe you have the answer to this, to the world's most wrongly answered housing question, which is, should I rent or should I buy? Should I rent or should I buy? Last week, I was on checking uh, my, my, my fun videos on YouTube. I'm, I'm, a, I'm someone who likes to watch pranks. And up came this new video about some financial analyst from, from Ontario here who was discussing the rent versus buy decision, and he had come up with a 5% rule. He, so he had come up with the rules of 5%. I looked down at the numbers of views, Jim, that this, that this fella had. It was 140,000 views in the lot in one week this YouTube video had from this financial advisor. Now, I'll tell you, Jim, this was a well-crafted YouTube video. Uh, this financial advisor, he bought software. He clearly had the green screen. Everything was done really, really well, except for the information he was giving to the public. And 147,000 people had watched this video in the week, first week it was out. He came out the following week with another video correcting the first video dropping his 5% rule to a 4% rule because of complaints that people had made on YouTube about the first video. And then I did some more searching, and I went back, Jim, and on YouTube, there are literally dozens of videos discussing the buy-to-own um, discussion, having the buy-to-own discussion. Should I buy or should I own? And what I will tell you is, every single one of those videos is flawed. They all use the wrong data. They all come to the same conclusion, which, in my opinion, are geared towards the message the author is trying to get across. If it's a financial advisor... I believe they're skewing this discussion so that people will rent and then invest their money with. I really believe that that's what I see. The financial advisor that I first started talking about here, that $147,000 view, who had a 5% rule that he subsequently the next week dropped to a 4% rule, that's what he's interested in. He's a financial advisor. I watched some of his other videos. It's clear what his messaging is trying to be. I couldn't care less. The Wealthy Homeowner Program could not care less whether you buy or you rent a home. The only thing that we're interested in is giving you the facts, the data, the rationale, the strategy, and then for you to make a decision which way you want to go. It makes no difference to us. We don't make any money based on your decision one way or the other. The rent-to-own decision is a complicated one, and it really does vary from person to person. But what I'll tell you is, is that in the rent-to-own discussion, the financial ad advisors who are doing these videos, including some very well-known Canadian financial advisors who do videos, are simply wrong. Their, their, their calculations are fundamentally wrong. When you're looking at a home, this is the way that every single Canadian should look at it. You are either the owner of a home that you're currently renting or you are currently renting a home from someone other than yourself. That is how the conversation must start. In other words, I am a landlord, and if I am going to be my own tenant, how do the financial numbers roll out for me as a landlord? 
Versus if I don't move into the house and rent it, I let someone else move into the house and rent it. That is the perspective that needs to take place in the rent-to-own discussion. From that place, you can start looking at some real data. I look at the, I look at these, all these different scenarios, Jim. Now they're on a, this Investopedia. I'm seeing them on YouTube. I'm seeing them on bank reports. I'm seeing the, I'm seeing on housing analyst reports. I've probably seen at least a hundred. They're all wrong. Now it's not that I'm, it's not that, you know, I'm arrogant enough to say that, that we're right. What I'm saying is, is that when you look at all the data on home ownership, on the cost of ownership, on the wealth building ability of a home, and you aggregate that into a discussion on whether it's best to rent or own, you have a totally different look or understanding about what you're talking about. In other words, if you're not budgeting for a new roof every 12 years in a single detached home, and you're not applying that to your determination of whether you should rent or own, then you're wrong. If you are not calculating for your condo fees increasing because the condominium, uh, the management company of your condominium has undersubscribed your condo fees and now your garage area is going to need a special assessment of $5,000, then your decision is based on bad data. If you have not calculated the total of interest payable over the course of, over, over the course of a, uh, your ownership lifetime, and you haven't properly built in a risk cost to those estimates, you can't answer the rent-to-own discussion. If you have not forecasted the value of your home over the length of time you're going to own it, and you haven't used historically, historically valid house price change metrics to make that determination, your calculation is going to be wrong. I was watching, Jim, where these guys, some of these guys, they say, okay, your house is going to increase at 5% a year. And I say, bull crap. Unless you live in Saskatchewan or a couple of provinces for very select 25-year windows, you're never going to see a 5% house price gain uh, annually over 25 years. It has never happened. Yet these folks are including that calculation. If you are calculating your interest payable based on your mortgage payment the first day you move into the property and you assume for the next 25 years it's going to be the same, your calculations are going to be wrong. You need to be able to look at a historical profile of a mortgage over a 25-year period. We are now in the rising side of the interest rate cycle. And you need to know what outside metrics you can use to safely determine what your mortgage interest rate cost is going to be in total over the next 25 years. Is the house you're buying 5 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old? Because I'll tell your listener that depending on the answer to that primal question, all of the calculations in the rent or own discussion have to be changed. And they have to be changed radically in order for someone to make a rational, informed, educated, fact-based decision on whether it's not, it's best to rent or own. So every listener to this podcast, to you, Jim, understand I am a supporter of home ownership. I know, reviewing 40 years of data, thousands of families' lifetimes of ownership, that the only way the average person builds wealth in Canada is through home ownership. There is also an alpha attached to how you own your home. The proper alpha re- doubles your return. So what is a 4% 25-year annual uh, growth in your house price? You can turn into an 8% gain, and that is what our elf is. We're able to do that for people. It's why we have a zero-risk, no-cost solution. These videos that discuss, should I buy or should I rent? How do you decide? This is the 5% rule. This is the 4% rule. Oh, this is the calculation about... Um, with a uh, an interest rate of 6% and house price growth of 3%. All of that you can throw in the garbage. Because all you have to ask is, oh, how old was the house this was predicated on? It was a five-year house. You're probably going to have 10 years of virtually no maintenance costs. Any renovation work that you're going to do is for your personal pleasure. 
Personal pleasure? Yeah. That is a calculation that has to be included in the rent-to-own discussion. Because anyone who does not think or believe the ability to choose where you live, where you set down roots, without someone someone else being able to kick you out, does not have a value, has not sat back and experienced being kicked out of a house because the landlord wants to sell it. Right. In Vancouver, we have rental evictions left, right, and center. Also, Ross, was I wrong to tell a friend who said, should I rent or should I buy? And I said, if you buy a house, and even if prices go down and so on, when you sell it, you get some money back. When you rent, you get no money back. Well, what I, what I, I mean, if you have some you, equity built up, you'll get some money back, even even if it isn't as much as you hope for. Is that, that not that better is, than renting, where you get no money back? That that is better. That is better, right? That would be better. But is it the best thing to do? That's really what the question comes down to. Are you, are, would you be okay? And, and we have now, see, Jim, when people get older, so say when you get to be 65, 70 years old, okay, this is where this question really comes into play. And, it, and it's a question that really is not discussed because it's a really, really hard question to bring up. I've had to bring it up with my own folks right now. How much are you willing to lose on your home? simply because you enjoy living there. Are you willing to lose? How, how? Let's say your house prices are deflating by 6% a year and you have a million-dollar property. Okay, so you're going to lose, for the sake of the argument, $60,000 on your house this year. It's going to be worth $60,000 less. Okay, if you're 70 years old, Jim, maybe that $60,000 is well worth it. Maybe it's well worth it living in the place that you call home for another year. I see, I hear all of these people who try to, to have the housing discussion as a uh, as a mental exercise in financial um, financial uh, best practices. That is that is ludicrous. Men, men fought and died to get their family into a cave, a cave, let alone a house. We love the places that we call home. There is an intrinsic value to that. The biggest discussion, the biggest discussion is how much is that worth to you? Because I'll tell you, Jim, that changes for everybody. For me personally, Jim, for me personally, it is a high, high value. There is no way, I had four kids, there is no way that I wanted to move my four kids from the place where we sat down roots, sat down roots. I wanted my kids to have the same backyard, the same bedroom, the same the same uh, the same schools, the same high schools. I wanted them to have that. There was a cost associated with that because it meant I didn't sell when prices started to fall. I stayed there. It meant that I didn't move to another home to, because I knew I could have doubled my money by moving to another property. Now, I was in a pretty nice house. So I wasn't, we weren't hard done by. But what I'm saying is, is that that had a cost. So when your friend says to you, hey, is it better to rent to own? And you say, well, if the prices go down, at least you still have been paying off your mortgage. You're still going to have $50,000 available. That's the really the correct answer. Okay, you're going to lose $50,000. You're going to lose it over two years at $25,000 a year. Was it worth it to enjoy life in that house for $25,000 a year? I mean, the price, people look at the price of a new Mercedes, a new BMW, a new Ford F-150 pickup. A new Ford F-150 pickup is like around sixty or $70,000. A new Suburban, $100,000 topped out. Okay, that money is gone in four to five years, folks. Was it worth it? That's the discussion that you really need to have when you're having the own versus buy discussion. That said, never, ever buy or try to buy in the trough of the housing market. 
don't buy at the peak. Don't buy in the upswing once you get, uh, once you, the, the market has uh, reached a point where a, uh, a peak is inevitable. Because how you set your up, self up on the very first day that you move into your home is going to determine how you move out 25 years later. We'll have more with Ross K. right after the break. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite and rich gold-bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, a long list of quoted economists and housing analysts are claiming that everywhere but Vancouver, the housing market has, quote, stabilized. Do you see it that way? Uh, no, I didn't see it that, that way last summer, Jim, when they were making those statements. Using seasonally adjusted Canadian Real Estate Association created stats, nor do I read it that way now. From real estate boards, local sales stats for the month of April and March. No, I don't read it that way. I read it totally differently. We read, we read it Totally different. The housing market in April continued to decline across Canada, except for Montreal and the neighboring small province. Okay? That is the only place in the country where the market, you could argue, was stabilized. Because most of the time, the Quebec market is stabilized. When you have a housing market that is only seeing three to four percent annual growth rate, that is a stabilized housing market. When your housing market doesn't swing, have huge swings in uh, annual gain or decline in house prices, that is a stabilized housing market. The housing market in Quebec is totally different than the housing market in every other province. Because the home ownership rate in Quebec is lower. In other words, the uh, tenancy rate in Quebec is higher. That naturally mitigates house price change. In Vancouver, you have a series of, 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 of uh, facts that are never accommodated for when these banks or the realtors are discussing your housing market. You, first of all, had a, an artificial inflation of 2015 numbers because of the $37,000 first-time buyer interest-free loan program. That created a single-year 2017 blip in your data, which in the following year, 18 and now 19, it's making things look worse than what they really were. It is a, when we look at the Vancouver market, we see a continual level deflating of your housing bubble because we accommodate for that 2017 change. The same way that we said in March of 2016, or excuse me, April of 2016, that your housing market had peaked in Vancouver. We didn't look at the data in July and try to say, oh, it's the foreign buyer tax is the reason the market collapsed. No, you had peak price in April of 2013 or 2016. They declined between April and July of that year. And then July forward, it just continued the path it was on. In Toronto, the Toronto housing market cycle was a year later than uh, Vancouver's. And Toronto didn't have the $37,000 boost. The Alberta housing market has had almost a 28% reduction in real home values since uh, 20, uh, 2015's peak. 
I know we told everyone the market was rolling over in uh, in uh, late 2013 and 2014. The uh, oil, the oil. Uh, the oil uh, price dropped, but it still didn't mean there's still there's still velocity in a market that carried prices forward right up till 2015. But that velocity was gone way back in 2013. So you just had to wait for that wave to crash to the to the, to the shoreline, the housing market. Okay, but from 2015 forward, in real house prices, they're down about 28 percent. So what are these people talking about when they say the market stabilized? You, if you look at the benchmark price in the greater Vancouver, no one would understand that houses have taken 30, 40, and 50% drops off the peak of 2016. You will not read that in those benchmark prices. It's like it's disappeared in the ether. The, the, the reality of those news headlines, which are ours, all stored in Google people. Go back and look at the headlines from April of 2016. And then ask yourself, how come no one is saying there has been a 30 to 40% house price correction in Vancouver? Why did the, none of the house price metrics record it? Well, they don't record it because people are only spending about 10% less. They just happen to be getting a house that is worth 20, 30, and 40% more at 10% less, which is how you get 30, 40, and 50% house price home selling for 30, 40, and 50 percent less than they, what they were at the peak of 2016. These are the fundamentals of the home trading infrastructure. This is why the great house price correction of the 1990s really doesn't show up anywhere in the data because home buyers may have been, may have spent $25,000 less a peak to trough in the 1990s in Ontario, but they were getting a house that was worth almost double. There are people who literally got houses at 50% off what they were selling for at the market's peak of 1990. But you don't see that in the data. The data doesn't show that. The data is only recording what buyers are paying. And the way that the data is aggregated into an annual um, price change means that when the sales as sales are slowly declining, the percentage of the annual change decreases. So that means at a time when the prices are the lowest annually, their share of the annual sales is also the lowest. So you don't see the real magnitude of the change. Organized real estate is built upon these cycles, which is why they use year-over-year -year comparisons of house prices. And they, once the new year starts, they don't talk about the months of the previous year. They don't talk about those anymore. If you look at every house price chart, it includes year-end totals. They don't show you what happened during the year. This is how home ownership, housing market math works. It's how you get a housing bubble. Because on the way up, it's just the opposite. You are always, more weight is being given on the way up to higher price homes selling. And on the way down, more weight is given to higher house, the higher house prices that are selling. The home buyer is never represented in the data, meaning their interests. The data is skewed to the favor of the sellers. Always has, always will be. If you are buying housing houses, if you look at 2018 house price change in Vancouver, your greatest house price change decrease happened at the end of the year when you are experiencing the fewest number of sales. The least amount of house price change was at the beginning of the year, when you were experiencing the highest number of sales. Well, guess what happens when you calculate for the average, folks? The sales at the start of the year overwhelm the sales at the end of the year, because there was more of them. This is the exact same thing while people don't understand what's really happened with the Canadian housing correction right now. The sales have shifted so unbelievably in Canada, people have no idea. They, they have no idea how sales have shifted. When, when we're looking at sales, when we're looking at the national numbers, we are always looking at a consistent um, share of sales to each of the provinces. We have another metric where we measure each of the municipalities, and we have a third metric where we, we do the municipal level at the category stage of the homes. It's only when you're looking at 
the municipal level data at category stage of the homes that you are going to see 30 and 40 percent house price correction. If you look at the top of the data, you won't see it. It doesn't exist because you're looking at the buyers. You're not looking at what the buyers are buying. And that's where this this problem is created. I want to let your listeners uh, on this note end with this. The province of Quebec in uh, December of 2016 was occupying 14.69% of Canadian sales. Right now, it's occupying 19.77%. British Columbia, British Columbia, at its peak, at its peak, in April of 2016, was commanding 22% of the sales in the country. British Columbia had a share of 22% of the sales in the country. Right now, it's only showing a 16% share. So your share of sales has dropped over 25%. And then everybody wonders, well, why is the Canadian national average selling price not dropped more? Because Vancouver's share of the sales has dropped even more than BC's. Because BC's sales are derived, have a share of sales that go to Vancouver. And Vancouver has a share of sales that goes to Kitsilano. And Kitsilano has a share of sales that go to single detached homes in Kitsilano. And that's, everybody wonders why you don't see a house price correction when the people who are owning these homes are living this experience. It's because the way that housing data, home sales data works and is aggregated hides the change from the public. It hides it. When things when the housing markets are expanding, it capitalizes on it. When a housing market is contracting, it capitalizes on it. It capitalizes on it for the benefits of organized real estate. Somehow, universities, academics, economists, housing analysts, governments don't know this fundamental of a housing market. I don't know why. But what I'm sitting here telling you, that your share of sales in British Columbia alone nationally has dropped from 22% to 16%. Shouldn't everybody in this country be jumping out of their chairs saying, why hasn't someone told me this before? Why hasn't someone explained to me what the real damage to the house prices are? Now you know where the stabilization myth comes from. The market stabilized. No. What's happened is there's more sales in, in a part of the country where house prices are increasing because there's more sales. And the places where prices are falling are having fewer sales, so the real decline is being hidden. Every single dollar of house price change from 1980 till April of 2019 is recorded in this sales data. We call it house price illusion for a reason, because it's the illusion that is created by the sales mix each and every month that in the following month is believed to be true. The sky is blue. You look outside, the sky is yellow. I tell you the sky is blue, and you believe me, because because everyone in the country believes the sky is blue because I told them it's blue. No, the sky is yellow. No, house prices do not go up in 30 days, and they do not go down in 30 days. It is actually a legal impossibility in Canada for house prices to change in 30 days. You can't call an appraiser in today and then call them in 30 days later and have them give you to arrive at two different prices. If they did, they would lose their appraisal license because either they were incompetent 30 days ago or they're incompetent today. That is not how it works. I mean, right now in Canada, people have to understand, especially your listeners in British Columbia, there were only 6,600 home sell across British Columbia in April. 6,600 homes. Okay, so you're going to tell me that 1.3 million homes are going to be valued on the opinion of 6,600 home buyers who have no idea what the prices of homes really are? You're not going to adjust for how the sales mix was in the month of April, where those homes were located? How many were located in Kitsilano this year versus last year 
versus two years ago? How many were single detached? How many were condominium? How many were rural property? How many, how many were in, in the city of Victoria? How many in Kelowna? Are you telling me that these random decisions being made by home buyers are going to impact the value of your home? You're shaking your head. Well, no, Ross, that doesn't make sense. Well, I'm telling you folks, every single price point that you see is a result of that myth. Those 6,600 home buyers in April of 2019 in British Columbia have been allowed to determine the value of every single home in Alberta, or excuse me, in British Columbia. Every single home. 6,600 home buyers who have no training, no skill, very minimal, if any, experience in even looking at a top two homes, let alone thousands, are the people the government's relying upon to determine the value of 1.3 million homes in British Columbia. I'm sorry, folks. But that is simply the truth. And as we go forward through this correction, I believe the 40 years of house price myth that have been perpetuated by organized real estate are going to be debunked. The same way that earlier in the show, we debunked the new mortgage stress test as being nothing more than a variable gross debt service ratio. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Hey, thanks for having me, Jim. And thanks for my long allowing me the long wind in this today. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K from the wealthy homeowner.ca. If you have any questions for Ross or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. You're listening to howstreet.com radio, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. You can find us on Twitter at howstreet. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.